Hello everyone and welcome to Common and Widespread, widespread Butterfly Species. Um, uh, welcome to a talk by Chris Winnick this uh, afternoon. I hope you are well. It's good to see your faces. Um, if you could keep your microphone off, that would be great. So um, we don't get any noises inter interfering with the presentation. Um, so um, if you have got any questions throughout this presentation, uh, webinar if you could um there's a chat symbol at the bottom of your screen if you click that and put any questions you have in it um, while we're going along i will read the, these out at the end of the presentation to chris and chris is good at answering questions so he'll be more than happy to answer your questions at the end oh just admitting a few more people in so yeah, welcome to Common and Widespread Species, Butterfly Species. Um, Chris Winnick is Chair of Butterfly Conservation and a trustee there as well. And he's passionate about butterflies and getting people interested in butterflies, which is why um, he's doing this webinar for us today. Um, the webinar is part of Get Cumbria Buzzing Project, which aims to increase the number of pollinators across Northwest Cumbria. And Chris's talk is one of our last talks in the series this year which is sad but it, we've had some great talks and Chris has done some amazing talks for us so really looking forward to this one today so I'll just hand you over to Chris there you go Chris thank you very much and I, I hope you can hear me clearly um, if uh, if you can't just put your hand up and I'll, I'll talk a little louder if I need to um, so as Lucy says, I'm, I'm Chris, I'm the chairman of Cumbria Butterfly Conservation. Thank you for tuning in today. Um, we're gonna move on because there are a lot of slides to, uh, to get through. So I just need to uh, make sure that I can move my slide forward and I don't know why I can't at the moment. Lucy, I seem to be stuck on slide one. You're stuck on slide one. Oh, um, there we go. <laughs> right, slide two. We're moving forward. Here we go. So just a little introduction uh, first. Um, why, why look at butterflies and moths? Uh, I'm not going to read out what's there in front of you, but I think there are lots and lots of great reasons for being interested in butterflies and moths. And of course, if you're going out on a walk, there are lots of day flying moths, as well as, of course, the ones that we normally expect to be about at night time. Um, for me, the, the main reason really is to add enjoyment to a lovely countryside walk. Uh, butterflies and moths tend to, to love lovely countryside areas. Um, lots of people in Cumbria are very blessed to be close to some beautiful walks. And it just adds so much interest and enjoyment. It lifts the spirit if you see butterflies and day flying moths flying around in the countryside. Um, butterfly conservation runs a lot of uh, recording schemes. Uh, we're very much a scientific organization based on data to, uh, to persuade the powers that be, we need to write. Uh, sorry, Chris, your presentation is stuck on the first slide. Ah, right, my slides are still moving. Maybe um, stop sharing screen and then share again. Maybe that'll work. Okay, so as I do this, the slides aren't, aren't turning. No, they're not, no. Right, thank you. Um, so you recommend I stop sharing? Yeah, so if you go into the share screen button and stop sharing, yeah, and then share again. See if that works. Got it. <laughs> yeah. Now, is that moving? Yeah, now it is. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Right, we've got up to here. Um, so um, I'm glad that's working because there are a lot of slides to, to get through. But um, if we are to persuade our paymasters and those we want to influence, uh, we do need data, we need evidence. And so butterfly conservation have an army of uh, volunteers who go out and collect data for us. And in Cumbria, 
we do invite all those that see butterflies and day flying moths to go to our uh, website, to go on to our sightings page and to enter data. And I know that many of you do. And if you haven't, you must have a look and see it's very easy to self enter any butterflies and day flying moths. So we monitor sites right across the country. We have an army of uh, volunteers. Some do weekly transects, others go to particular sites. Some just like to note down what they see on a country walk or indeed what they see in their garden. But uh, it does give us the information we need to see which butterflies are doing well and which are doing less well, and then to try to work out why that is the case. Uh, and then if we um, do the right analysis, um, we hopefully can produce uh, reports that will inform us on what needs to be done in the future. But sadly, uh, two thirds of our butterflies are in decline. Uh, in particular, the rarer species are getting rarer. Some of the more common, more widespread species that we'll be concentrating on today are not getting any rarer. They're indeed increasing in numbers in some parts of the UK. But um, moths again, I'm sure you remember those days, perhaps many years ago, when a lot of moths would be found sadly dead on the windscreen of a car after an evening's drive, especially on a warm muggy night in the summer. Well, those days are very, very far apart now, aren't they? And uh, we very rarely find such numbers of moths. And of course, this is one reason why we have far fewer blue tits and other birds that rely on moth caterpillars to feed their young. We're going to concentrate on the wider species, but we can broadly divide all butterflies into specialist ones that tend to be very particular, and very fussy. They're fussy about their habitats and they're fussy about their caterpillar food plants, as opposed to the wider countryside species that are more likely to be found in your garden, in your neighborhood, along country lanes and to places near to where you live. These are less fussy. Um, their caterpillars will often feed on a wider variety of plants. Uh, some of them like nettles, which are of course quite widespread. And at this time of year, a lot of them will be coming into your garden to, to feed up on, on the nectar that's found in your gardens. So I'm not going to go through this list, but uh, on the left are the specialist butterflies like the swallowtail, the high brown fritillary and so on. On the right, uh, the wider countryside species that like to fly from garden to garden or from field to field. And these are the ones that we're most likely to encounter in Cumbria. Um, it's not a gloom and doom downward trend year on year. You'll see the graph show the picture is much more up and down, good years and less good years. But um, overall, the fussy ones, because they are so particular, uh, they've declined rather more than the widespread species that we'll be focusing on. And you might think, well, why, why is this? And of course, we have habitat loss. And with habitat loss, habitats become fragmented and isolated. Also, some habitats are no longer managed in the way they used to be. And so the quality of the habitat is degraded. And of course, climate change. And some of you might have seen this slide, but uh, it amuses me to keep showing it. Uh, here is proof of global warming. So I'm told, not that I would know, I hasten to add. But more seriously, um, if we look at the data, uh, and in particular, the red line, which is uh, a running uh, average, you'll see that um, temperatures are actually not year on year, but over a run of years, uh, significantly increasing. And uh, this is definitely having an impact on all our butterflies and moths, and indeed on wildlife in general. So there are other reasons then, apart from habitat loss and fragmentation, a lot of them are to do with things like atmospheric pollution, burning of fossil fuels, car emissions and chemical pollution. Climate change we've mentioned, in particular the long, wet, mild winters that we have, and sometimes the rather variable summers. Uh, certainly the more extreme events that are occurring, we can see on the news only this week, 
how the number of extreme events in Europe is uh, really becoming quite, uh, quite significant and a big worry. And then, of course, uh, changes in land use, changes in agricultural practice, uh, removal of hedgerows. Sadly, still, still hedgerows are being grubbed up and removed and replaced by fences that are more easy to, to manage and maintain. Um, and some sites are being abandoned and not managed in the way that they used to be. Of course, with agricultural intensification comes greater use of pesticides, fertilizers, insecticides, and so on. So these are some of the problems that uh, we're having to, to face. Uh, broadleaf woodland in Cumbria is not managed in the old traditional coppice plot rotation method. Um, farming methods are changing, climate change, reclamation of brownfield sites. Some of our finest butterfly sites in Cumbria, surprisingly perhaps, are actually on brownfield or derelict land. But of course, a lot of this is now being uh, reclaimed and built over, tarmacked, concreted, glassed, glassed over, um, bricked over, cemented over. In the country, we're losing an area the size of Bristol every year to urban development. And then we mentioned uh, fragmentation, loss of connectivity. Some butterflies need to be able to travel from one site to a neighboring site. But if there is uh, uh, unfavorable habitat in between, this can act as a barrier. And of course, all these things can lead to genetic weakness because then butterflies become isolated and inbreeding can take place. Ideally, what we'd like to do then using our data that I mentioned earlier is to assess the situation, uh, diagnose the, the problem, test solutions, and then introduce management practices that can mitigate against some of the problems that I've mentioned. And hopefully that will lead to recovery. And clearly if it does, as it has done, for example, with the marsh fertility in uh, North Cumbria, we can then manage in a sustainable way. And I say sustainable because although we have bred lots of caterpillars and butterflies to release, we no longer need to do that because now we have sites that are sustaining this population on its own without intervention. So that would be the ideal to get to a, a plateau stage where management is no longer involved in terms of constant intervention. We really want to leave it to nature, but we have to get to that point first. And that's the difficult part. Anyway, uh, we're going to focus on the 40 butterflies that we have, and in particular, the 20 or 25 that we're most likely to see. And as you can see from this slide, uh, we're very lucky in Cumbria to have so many of the UK species. It's quite exceptional to have so many this far north. And these are some of the butterflies we'll be looking at. And they're a wonderful sight. Just looking at them can lift the spirits. Uh, to see a blue butterfly, perhaps a holly blue, flitting in your garden in late March, more likely April, um, when they first emerge in the spring, is, is a great joy, I think. These are some of the butterflies we're not going to be concentrating on. Uh, I've given a separate talk on some of our fussier butterflies, and Cumbria is actually fortunate in having some of these rarities, like the high brown and the pearl bordered fritillary and the Duke of Burgundy, but these are not likely to, to come into gardens or to fly along country lanes near where you live. Um, if you know the right places to go at the right time, you can certainly find them. And butterfly conservation, and indeed the Cumbria Wildlife Trust, organize uh, walks, guided walks, to see some of these more specialized butterflies. So look out for new programs in particular for uh, the next year. So these are some of our rarities, but we're going to focus on the um, on the ones that are a little bit more common than that, uh, and in particular ones that like grassy habitats. I'll go back to that slide. We won't um, be seeing the one in the bottom left. I wish we would. The marbled white is only found further south. But here we have species that like taller grasses, and these are doing quite well. With our long wet mild winters we're getting a lot of taller grass and species like the large and small skipper the ringlet in the bottom right and the gatekeeper bottom center uh, sorry uh, the, yes the gatekeeper they're, they're all doing quite well at the moment so they like taller ranker grasses some like uh, damper grasses 
Again, the ringlet is happy in damper grasses. The orange tip in the bottom right is happy in damp meadows, water meadows, as is the green veined white. On limestone, and we have plenty of lovely limestone grasslands in South Cumbria and parts of East Cumbria. In fact, there's a ring of limestone really, isn't there, all around the central uh, Lake District. Uh, then we're lucky to have uh, in the top left, the common blue, the center, top center, uh, the northern brown argus, and then the small heath and bottom left, the uh, um, dingy skipper. And then in our upland areas, um, well, the dark green isn't particularly rare, but it's not one we're going to focus on because it does have particular habitat preferences that uh, would tend to make it less likely to be seen uh, locally. Um, the green hair streak, um, you haven't got to go far from where I live, for example, in Kendall, to see sites with um, green hair streak, but it does like slightly more specialist areas where there's plenty of its caterpillar food plant, in particular bilberry, uh, sometimes birdfoot trefoil, gorse, broom, and other species. It's not quite so fussy about its food plant, the caterpillar food plant. Uh, bottom right is the small heath, and then the beautifully marked small copper in the bottom left. In peat boggy areas, and again, there's some both in North and South Cumbria, on our raised mires, you might be lucky enough to find the large heath, but uh, again, not locally. And then on brown field sites, which sadly I say we are losing quite a few of, some of these lovely species here. Right, uh, then in woodlands, um, in unmanaged woodlands, uh, these are the ones that are most likely to be found. Uh, top right is the speckled wood, which has become one of our more common species. The uh, bottom right is out now, the purple hair streak, but you'd have to look at the tops of oak trees. Bottom left, the white letter hair streak. Uh, again, you'd be looking more um, at elm trees, but they have just uh, finished their flight period. And then the lovely holly blue that is actually on the wing at the moment. There's a second brood out right now, but in low numbers. But if you see a blue butterfly coming into your garden, uh, perhaps you have over the last couple of weeks or the next week or two, it's almost certainly the holly blue. And commas again, will certainly visit gardens, especially in the autumn if you have um, nectar sources for them to, to feed on. Uh, and also they love fallen apples and pears and rotting fruit. And then in our woodlands, these are some of our specialist butterflies that we're lucky enough to, to have, which pushes our total up to 40 species in Cumbria, which, as I mentioned, is really quite remarkable to have so many species of butterfly. And then on butterfly identification, most of us know a little bit about adults on the wing, but of course the adult stage might only last for as little as a week or two. Don't forget butterflies spend much of their life as eggs, uh, caterpillars, and as pupa. Sometimes far more of their life uh, in those other stages. Um, in particular, of course, they hibernate uh, over winter, some as an egg, some as a caterpillar, some as pupas, and some of the ones I'll be focusing on um, will be uh, looking for places in the next couple of months, perhaps in sheds, garages and barns and roof spaces to hibernate as adults. Uh, but here are all the life st uh, stages. This is the um, brown hair streak, which has just been seen in Arnside. Uh, it's one of the last butterflies to emerge. So they don't tend to emerge in this part of the woods until uh, until early August, and it should be on, on the wing throughout August. But you can see the little eggs there, the caterpillars feeding on uh, blackthorn, the pupa, and then we have a mating pair of uh, brown hair streak. So the egg is sometimes called the ovum, the caterpillar can be also called the larva and, and the pupa, uh, the chrysalis. And of course, it's remarkable that they go through these changes and in particular how a caterpillar can pupate and then sometimes just a few weeks later um, emerge as an adult. That metamorphic stage is really, I think, um, quite a stunning aspect to their life cycle.
Um, sometimes adults are called the imago stage, uh, the breeding stage. And um, if you haven't got books or references or guides, I suggest you, you get guides like this. Uh, the Field Studies Council do produce a series of fantastic laminated guides on both butterflies, caterpillars, and day flying moths. And also you can buy lots of other simple books like this, uh, this guide here to, to butterflies, uh, illustrated by Richard Lewingdon. There are also photographic guides that you can buy. I'm just going to go back because it seemed to uh, have moved on by itself. There we are. Right, we're going to start by looking at the, um, the family of whites. And certainly I've seen whites flying past my window in the last 10 minutes, which is nice. We've got the sun out in Kendall. It's about um, 18 degrees. It's certainly warm enough for butterflies at this time of year to be flying about. And I've seen some small whites and possibly um, a green veined white as well. Apologies, the slides are just jumping about a little bit. I hope it settles down. But um, you're most likely to see at uh, this time of year small white. Uh, and yes, of course, they will feed on brassicas and they will feed on people's uh, vegetable plots, in particular if they're growing cabbages. So some people call them a pest. I always say, well, grow some, uh, some nasturtium because they will also eat nasturtium and that might divert at least some of them away from your cabbage. And then if that doesn't work, uh, at least uh, perhaps a finer mesh over the cabbages to stop the butterflies from laying eggs on one of their favorite food plants. But um, large white will also do the same, of course. They, they like brassicas. But uh, the green vein white will cause less bother to a vegetable plot. They prefer country lanes and damper meadows. And they're, they're quite a wide family of wild brassica related plants that they will feed on. So um, they're, they're less of a, a pest. But to me, I don't see them as pests. Perhaps I might change my mind if I was growing, trying to grow lots of prize cabbages. But um, I, I love to see them. Um, now, the top left is a slightly unusual picture because here we have um, a small white actually being attacked and sadly probably killed by a crab spider. You can see these spiders will often lie in wait, um, quite often on, uh, on a flower head, waiting for a butterfly to land. They can camouflage themselves quite well. Uh, and then of course will pounce onto a, a butterfly and will inject a poison that paralyzes it. So they can then uh, feed on its, uh, on its innards, which is not a very nice thought. But I guess some of these spiders are in their way part of the food chain, part of the food web, uh, and are beautiful in their own right. So I, I mustn't be too hard on, on the predator spiders. Um, and then top right, you can see the lovely markings on a green veined white. And bottom left is actually a female orange tip. And if you're wondering where the orange is, of course, it's only the male that has that orange. Uh, the female is marked as you see it. And then in the bottom right, the brimstone is also a member of the white family. And what a beautiful butterfly that's on the wing at the moment. Um, you do occasionally get them coming into gardens, but you do need to be near blackthorn, sorry, buckthorn. The caterpillars will only feed on buckthorn and purging buckthorn. So if you really want brimstones in the garden, uh, Buddleias, yes, are great for nectar, but the best thing to do is to actually plant a buckthorn. And then you'll have caterpillars um, and you'll have the adults coming into your garden. And what a stunning butterfly. That's the, uh, the male, which is the more yellow version of the, the two. The female is a more subtle, lighter green, um, but they're the sun shining through the yellow. A great sight in spring. They, they first emerge from hibernation on a nice sunny day late in March, uh, early in April, depending on the weather. But look at the profile of the leaf. Uh, now, a Freudian slip there. The, the profile of the wing, which is very much leaf shaped. They, they hibernate, not so much in people's sheds and garages, 
but the brimstone prefers foliage because it knows that its wings look just like a leaf. And you can even see the veins and the shape of the leaf. Uh, um, so it's a great camouflage. It's a survival technique, of course. And there's the female, more subtly marked. You can see um, it's out when hawk pit is out. Um, again, the veins are very prominent and that lovely leaf-shaped profile. Sometimes mistaken for a large white. Um, in flight, they can look really quite white looking and need just a slightly closer inspection when they land to be absolutely certain. But there it is again, one of my favorite butterflies. It's actually the longest lived butterfly as an adult. So uh, they're on the wing at the moment. Some of them came out as early as um, late June and they will fly right through August into September, sometimes even October before hibernating and then will then re-emerge in early spring and will fly on sometimes right through to May. In other words, an adult can actually be an adult for up to 10 or even 10 and a half months, which is um, by far the longest lived of our butterflies. Most butterflies as adults are much, much shorter lived than that. So there's the, um, the brimstone, there's an egg on uh, buckthorn, and you can see a pupa in the bottom left. The, the graph doesn't tell us a lot, really, in that it's relatively stable in terms of population. Uh, as buckthorns seem to become less common north of Windermere, so the distribution does uh, somewhat reflect that as you move north. They are one or two pockets of um, brimstone near Carlisle, but uh, certainly South Cumbria seems to be much more of a stronghold, and this very much reflects the distribution of buckthorn. What a stunning butterfly, again, uh, to see an orange tip, a male orange tip this time with its orange tips um, in the spring is a delight. You can see it's uh, nectaring on primrose, so we're talking now about probably uh, April time, maybe early May. A beautiful butterfly. The female wants to be more camouflaged. Again, you can see the bluebells are out, so bluebell time would be perhaps May time. And bluebells are often found on, in woodlands or woodland edges, along country lanes. And that again, very much suits the habitat of the orange tip. They will come into gardens, especially if you have food plants. If you've got some mayflower, um, also known as cuckoo flower, uh, or uh, jack by the hedge, um, then they will be happy to, to come and lay eggs in gardens and nectar in gardens. But country lanes are a great site to see these butterflies. Uh, there we have a male and female on the left, and you can see the subtle markings of the female on the right. You can see she's bending her abdomen to lay a single egg on cuckoo flower, mayflower, um, usually the eggs are laid singly because in the early stages of life, the caterpillars are cannibalistic. So she knows if she lays a cluster of eggs, then many will actually not survive. They'll be eaten by their brothers and sisters. Um, there we are again, you can see top left uh, on uh, Mayflower, Jack by the hedge in the center. And you can see how the caterpillars are very well camouflaged in the top right, looking like the, the stems of their food plants. So that, that's again, all part of uh, their escape from uh, being predated. So Lady Smock is another name, cuckoo flower, mayflower. It's uh, I think all the same plants. The botanists will be able to correct me, I'm sure. Um, that's one of their favorite uh, food plants and it's quite widespread in Cumbria. So the orange tip is, quite a widespread butterfly, it's doing quite well uh, in Cumbria. And there's the, um, the green vein white in close up, you can see those lovely veins, they're not particularly green, there's a hint of green about the butterfly, I think. If anything, they are slightly more grey than green, but uh, you can almost see the little individual scales on a close up photograph like this. And there's the green vein white in a typical habitat. It likes those slightly longer grasses, slightly damper 
uh, meadows, um, so wherever it's a little bit waterlogged or marshy or a little bit damper, and then they're very happy to fly. And again, they're out on the wing at the moment uh, in quite good numbers. Um, they will come into gardens at this time of year, but um, you're more likely to see them in, in damper, uh, wet lying areas a little bit perhaps further away. And here's the uh, small white uh, in close up again. You can almost see the little individual scales on the small white. And there it is again, feeding on knatweed. Um, this time it looks like it's on bird's foot trefoil. Now, these are large whites. Um, they are larger. Uh, they do show up usually in flights. They have a slower wing beat. They do a little bit more gliding. They can move a little bit more quickly with less flapping. Um, the male is the one at the top with the black tips. The female actually has black spots, although she has her wings shut um, during the act of mating. Um, and a white that you're not likely to see, sadly, uh, although in some years you might, is the clouded yellow. This is very much a migrant. So um, like the Painted Lady and one or two others, um, their numbers will vary hugely from year to year. I haven't seen any this year. Usually we do see one or two in Cumbria, and some years, perhaps one in 10, are quite reasonable numbers, but it very much depends on the migration that comes across from the continent. But again, a member of the white family. And there it is again. Right, um, another family, um, and these are certainly out now, all of them, and very much in your gardens and in local places. You'll notice that uh, two of them are photographed on Budlia. And yes, it's great to have um, Budlia in the garden at this time of year. Some Budlias are going over. Um, a tip, and that is to have more than one Budlia and to grow it in a different aspect, perhaps one south and southwest facing, but maybe one facing east uh, or even uh, northwest. Uh, that might mean that your Budlia will come out a little later. Uh, also, if you prune one Budlia early in the year and one a little later, that will help to spread the uh, the emergence of the flowers. Because sometimes people say to me, well, I've got a lovely Budlia, Chris, and it's just over. And now all these peacocks in the top right are coming out and the Budlia has gone. So this way you can actually um, encourage the peacocks to come more into your garden. Um, but the peacock is a stunning butterfly. And again, it has a defense system. You'll see these eye spots can be flashed at the bird and if it shuts its wings and suddenly flashes the wings open, it can have a scaring effect. Also, if a bird does think, well, I'm not going to be scared, I'm going to peck your eyes, it will tend to peck the eye spots rather than the actual eyes of the butterfly. And that way there'll be a clip in the wing, but the butterfly will escape. So again, it's, uh, it's a means of survival. The bottom right is the comma. Um, Looks like it's on an allium of some kind, and some alliums are very good nectar sources. Um, but um, again, it loves Budlia. It loves um, all sorts of butterflies, uh, all sorts of uh, nectar sources in your garden at this time of year. So asters are, or Michaelmas daisies, they're, they're a wonderful late uh, nectar source for these butterflies. Uh, and of course, quite a few, um, um, I'm trying to think of, yes, sedums, quite a few sedums, in particular, sedum spectabilis, sedum meteor. These are the paler varieties of sedum. Sedum autumn joy is okay, but not, not quite as good as the white sedums and the very pale pink sedums. Um, the bottom left is the small tortoiseshell, of course, on a white buddleia, and then the, the lovely red admiral that's uh, about at the moment is the top left. Now, this is a, a, a nettle patch, and of course, having a nettle patch in your garden or near to your garden will mean that um, peacocks in particular will lay eggs in batches. The caterpillars will form a community and stay as a, as a, a, a colonial sort of community batch. 
until they're almost ready to pupate and then they'll spread and dissipate over a wide area. But um, certainly nettle patches are great for peacocks and also for uh, small tortoiseshells. So, uh, and there's the painted lady in the bottom right. And I have seen a few painted ladies about at the moment. You remember two years ago, the, uh, the hillsides and indeed our gardens were awash with literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of painted ladies that came in on a huge migration from the continent. Um, again, their numbers will vary from year to year, but at the moment there are reasonable numbers of painted lady about, not quite as many as uh, peacocks, red admirals and tortoiseshells. Commas, um, well, perhaps they're still picking up, but in fairly low numbers at the moment. So here's the peacock. Um, you'll see what I mean by flashing its wings, because when it shuts its wings, it looks very dark and black and can merge into a dark background. And then if it feels threatened, it might suddenly flash its wings open to hopefully survive by causing a certain amount of scariness. And there's a, a close up of a caterpillar on, uh, on some nettle, it's, its main food plant. And here it is on, uh, on white buddleia. And then its close relative, the small tortoiseshell, a beautiful butterfly. Um, and here is um, another relative, the red admiral. Now the peacock and the uh, tortoiseshell have a lot of antifreeze in their bodies and can hibernate over winter, even in very severe winters. And in fact, those winters that we used to have years ago, those really frosty ones uh, are good because they reduce predation, they reduce the chance of disease and parasites and so on. The Red Admiral sadly doesn't really have as much antifreeze in its body. Um, certainly it can't survive if temperatures drop much below freezing and it knows that, it's certainly aware and to survive, most red admirals fly south. So they, they're here in the autumn, but once we get to October, November, most will fly further south and many will fly back across the continent. I say back because actually red admirals are partially migratory anyway, and a lot of them arrive from the continent in the first place. Um, so it realizes that its chances of survival are less. Although having said that, of course, in Southern England, especially with these milder winters, more and more are surviving and more and more are staying here. So it's becoming more of a resident and less of a migrant than it used to be. But they do love Michaelmas daisy, as do most of these Vanessid species. Um, and of course, Michaelmas daisies are wonderful at this time of year for building up their reserves because they do need whether they're going to hibernate here or fly back to France and Spain they're going to need um, a lot of energy to get through so they 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 will come into gardens because gardens actually in the autumn are really the best places to provide feeding stations for these butterflies which they desperately need at that time of year and there's the red admiral with its wings closed. And here's the comma, not pecked by birds. It looks a little pecked, but that's exactly how they are. It's the only butterfly that really has these amazing ragged wings from birth. Um, you'll notice it's feeding on hemp agrimony, which is out at the moment. Um, so having got through the winter hibernation, because commas have the requisite amount of antifreeze. Uh, they'll be on the wing in late March and April and sometimes into May. And now the offspring are on the wing. And so this will be one of the offspring that's now feeding in, uh, in high summer, late summer on hemp agrimony. Uh, there it is with its wing shut and you'll see why it gets its name, the comma, with that little white comma mark uh, distinctive on the underwing. And there's a close-up again, beautifully marked in close-up. So here are the life cycles again of the uh, of the comma. 
a, a, a beautifully marked butterfly. Um, and uh, the caterpillar is almost equally well marked. You can see feeding on nettle and how it suspends its pupa from a, a leaf. And of course, another good nectar source at this time of year is bramble, as you can see in the bottom left. And I suspect bottom right, that might be a plum. I'm going to guess it is. I can't remember <laughs> that's a plum, but they certainly do like uh, fruit, as I mentioned uh, earlier. So the caterpillar's task really is to be the feeding machine. People often say to me, well, if I have buddleias and other nectar sources in my garden, is that really the answer? You know, to put lots of plants in my garden, good old fashioned varieties where butterflies can actually get their proboscis into the center of the plant, unlike some of these newer varieties that um, are almost impossible uh, for pollinators and nectar feeders to get into. Um, well, uh, it's, of course, it's the caterpillar that's key. And so really our garden should have lots of native species of, of grass, um, of, uh, of, of flowers that uh, we know will provide leaves for butterflies, for the caterpillars to feed on, uh, for nice old fashioned hedgerows, um, which again are wonderful for shelter and for hibernation, and indeed uh, can act as food sources for certain butterflies and in particular moths. So if you really want to have a wildlife garden, we need to think about all the stages, really, not just the, the adult stage. But um, I would love to see a Camberwell beauty. It's related to the peacocks and painted ladies, but um, it's a very, very rare migrant. So that's, that's one of my dreams, to, uh, to see this rare migrant. They are about, um, in Cumbria, maybe one a year turns up. But as yet, I, I've never seen one. Uh, they usually fly in from, uh, from Scandinavia. But painted ladies certainly are about. And what a beautiful butterfly that is. There it is with its wings shut. Um, quite nicely camouflaged in a way on, uh, on white buddleia. Now, urban settings can be surprisingly good. Um, I've already hinted that of course, gardens can be so important at this time of year. It's just a shame that um, we've been told that we must turn our front garden into a carport and our back garden into decking or into astroturf. And sadly, some people, of course, are doing exactly that. Um, it certainly means that gardens are the ones that are left are more important than ever. Um, so if you've got flowering ivy for holly, uh, for the holly blue, because they also feed on ivy, ivy and holly, and a lot of things will actually um, roost in ivy and hibernate in ivy. Uh, many verbenas, in particular verbena bonarensis, is a great late garden nectar source. Uh, if you want to put one of those in your flower beds, that's a super plant to put in. But um, if you go to urban areas, there are often lots of little brownfield sites scattered about. There are two or three just down the road from where I live. A lot of them get covered in buddleia, and some of them get covered in butterflies. So in Kendall, uh, back in 2015, just down the road from where I live, I saw 27 small tortoiseshell and 26 red admiral, and a small white and a peacock, just happily in one small plot. Um, very close to, to where some of us watching this now live. And then in, in Lancaster and in Barrow, again, good numbers. In Lancaster, you'll see astonishing nearly 100 tortoiseshell and nearly 100 red admiral um, on some of the brownfield sites in the center of the city of Lancaster. Now, um, with climate change, certainly that has benefited some of our more common species. So commas have moved right through Cumbria and up into Scotland and are now motoring towards the very north of Scotland. Uh, speckled wood were hardly in Cumbria by 1990, but are now one of our commonest butterflies and are very widespread. Ringlets, again, I remember Rob Petley-Jones, the 
retired senior warden of Natural England and manager of Gate Barrow contacting me in 2014 saying that a ringlet had arrived at Gate Barrow National Nature Reserve, the first one. And just three years later, Rob said to me, it's now the commonest butterfly. And five years later, there are more ringlets on Gate Barrow than all the other species put together. So ringlets have certainly benefited from these long, wet, mild winters with lots of extra grass growth. So the caterpillars are very happy feeding on grasses. And bottom right, the small skipper. I remember a lady contacting the county recorder in the year 2000 saying that she'd just seen a small skipper. And he replied saying, I'm sorry, madam, you're mistaken. It was a large skipper because we don't actually have any small skipper in Cumbria, but she'd seen the first. And now we have 100 colonies right across the county. Every year, more and more colonies. It's one of our commonest species. It might come into your garden. They're certainly spreading. I live within a couple of hundred meters of a good colony of small skipper that I'll be looking at in just um, over an hour's time after this talk. I'll be up on Kendall Fell and Kendall Fell is very good for small skipper. Um, two years ago, I think it was two years ago, I, I counted 80 in just uh, an hour's walk. So I don't think I'll be counting 80 this afternoon, but there will still be a few hanging on. We are coming towards the end of their flight period. But small skippers have done very well. Bottom left, the gatekeeper is doing well. It is expanding, but uh, at a less rapid pace. So you might have to visit one or two little hedgerows, especially where there's some nice brambles in flower. And I'm going to say something rather odd, um, especially if the brambles are close to a gate, because remarkably, I don't know whether it's just me, but I seem to find more gatekeepers keeping their eye on gates than in other places. So it's quite, quite a well-named butterfly. But you can see the spread, the effect of climate change with um, uh, comma, in the purple squares a few years ago, moving into the orange squares through Cumbria, and the latest figures show it's right up through Scotland, and the same, of course, with, um, with the orange tip. Quite a rapid spread, and without doubt, evidence of climate change. So, I mean, that's good news, that these things are expanding their range, and some of them are becoming more widespread and more common. Um, we can record this, we've got the data, we, we can analyze things and show that these things are really happening. And they're all lovely butterflies and they're very welcome um, and they all feed on grass and it's no coincidence that um, they are grass feeders. Um, the small heath, top left, I haven't said much about that, not, oh, excuse me. Um, it's got a slight life of its own, this machine. It keeps turning itself on uh, without me touching anything. But the small heath is quite common in, uh, in Cumbria. It quite likes more elevated locations in more open countryside. So if I want to see small heath, I will see a few on Kendall Fell. But I know that if I go to Scout Scar, uh, I'll probably see quite a few more. And if I go a little higher up onto some of the more open fells, um, earlier in the year, they are almost at the end of their flight period, then you can see hundreds, sometimes many hundreds. Whenever I go to Erton Fell to see the mountain ringlet in early June, I usually end up seeing hundreds of small heath, as well as the mountain ringlet. They can be found at quite high elevations. Nationally, they've not done so well. Uh, some people are concerned that we're we're losing uh, colonies across the UK, but in Cumbria, they, they do seem to, to like it here. Um, the speckled wood's an interesting butterfly in that it's very much a woodland species and can be found in dappled sunlight in, in our woods. Sometimes when all other butterflies think to themselves, this wood is uh, 
just getting too dark, I'm going to turn around and go back. The, the speckled wood will think, well, I actually quite like it. A bit of dappled light, a bit of shade, and I can uh, blend in with the background. I'm well marked, I'm well suited in terms of its camouflage. And if, I, if I'm a male and I perch myself in a clearing in a wood, I will uh, defend my territory because I'm quite territorial. I will spiral and combat with other males that come in. And then um, I'll wait for a female to mate. And um, they've been very successful at, the, at this strategy. It's uh, I say a widespread butterfly throughout our woodlands in, uh, in Cumbria. Um, it's also slightly unusual in that um, it overwinters in two different stages. Some overwinter as pupa, and they're the first to emerge in late March, early April. And some overwinter as caterpillars, and so will emerge a few weeks later. And they all have a second brood. And so given that they have two times of emergence and two second broods, it's a butterfly that can be seen on the wing almost continuously from late March right through sometimes into November. Um, it doesn't mean it lives a long time. It just means you're seeing lots of different butterflies. So that can be deceptive, can't it? You can think, well, these adults seem to be living for weeks or months. But of course, many of them actually only live for perhaps two or three weeks. But you're seeing another butterfly and another butterfly as more and more emerge over the course of the spring, winter and autumn. The meadow brown is the female, the slightly larger female with its bigger, brighter patches on its forewings. Again, a grass feeder, quite widespread and fairly common and has had quite a good year. There's still a few meadow browns on the wing. They were hit by the rain that we had. We've had some quite heavy rain over the last few days, haven't we? So that's knocked them on ahead a little bit. But I know if I went up onto Kendall Fell, which I will be, um, I will see a few, uh, not too many, but they will be about. They, they will come into gardens, especially if your garden is on the edge of a town or village. If you're near to a field, near to a hedgerow, near to a meadow, they like country lanes. They're quite widespread. Their food plant is widespread and they're quite successful and they're quite happy with our long, wet, mild winters. And they're a pair of mating meadow browns. The female is the one uh, above and the male below. Uh, the ringlets, you'll see, as I mentioned, when Rob Petley Jones said how they've really taken off at Gate Barrow, they've gone from nothing to substantial numbers and they're very widespread. You'll notice that the um, ringlet in the top right has very big rings, and the one in the bottom left has very tiny rings uh, because ringlets will vary. Um, most are in between those two extremes, but you, you will get some that are almost ringless and others that have very prominent uh, rings. When they first emerge, they have that lovely white edge that you can see because they, they do look a little bit like a meadow brown at times and they will fly in the same locations and they, their flight period overlaps substantially. Ringlets are largely over now, whereas meadow browns came out a little later and certainly will fly a little longer. Um, meadow browns will keep going through August if we get good weather, sometimes even into the first week of September. Ringlets are very much uh, over now. I saw my last ringlet, I guess, probably about a week, maybe, maybe 10 days ago. I think a few very tatty specimens in more woodland sites that are shadier and cooler probably uh, survived until the last few days. But the, the ringlet has that lovely white border, especially when it's fresh, whereas the, the meadow brown doesn't have that. And there's a male and a female ringlet uh, mating. And there's one with almost no rings. And that's a more typical pose. You can see it's just um, resting on uh, bramble. Um, it can often be found where bramble grows. It likes to nectar on bramble. It likes to sit on bramble leaves, beginning to lose its scales. When they freshly emerge, they have that real 
plain chocolate, almost velvety feel about them. And then they start to fade uh, with age. And there's a one with no rings and a very distinctive white border against a chocolatey background. The, the gatekeeper is expanding, generally doing quite well, although it's a little more localized, not quite so widespread as the ringlet and the meadow brown. Um, here it's sitting on bracken, you can see. Uh, we've got the female uh, top right and the male top left. So the female has a little bit more orangey color when it opens its wings. The bottom left, if you saw one of those, I would get your camera out very, very quickly because that's quite a rare aberration. They don't normally have those pale patches, but um, as you can tell, they do vary. All these butterflies will vary. That's a more typical pose. And there we are with its ring shut, uh, with its wing shut, quite, um, quite a nice butterfly. Most of these butterflies in close up are much more attractive. People can dismiss them as, oh, it's just a white or it's just a brown. And yet when you look closely, they really are beautifully marked. And of course the same must go for many moths that get a bad press. Oh, it's just a small little brown boring moth. And yet moths in close up are really quite stunning. So there's the ringlet, uh, and the, the gatekeeper feeding on ragworts. And ragworts are wonderful late nectar source at this time of year. And here we have a, a small heath, not to be confused with the ringlet. I think they do look a little bit alike. The small heath is slightly smaller and has that more distinctive uh, orangey forewing. And there's a pair of uh, mating small heath. You won't find small heath with their wings open, or if you do, I, again, I'll get your camera out very quickly, because normally when they land, they shut their wings almost immediately. And the grayling, the same. Um, it shuts its wings and it folds its forewing down into its hind wing, makes itself as small as possible. And you'll see its hind wing looks incredibly like the rock that it's sitting on. Um, and they will deliberately select uh, surfaces that look like their hind wing for maximum camouflage. So they love limestone. Um, I like to see them at White Scar, which is, as some of you will know, the southern tip of Whitbarrow. But where we have limestone, limestone scree, limestone pavement, um, bare earth patches too, sometimes just gravelly tracks, they will follow a path. Uh, either a dirt path or a gravel path, because they know that if they just sit on the path or sit on a limestone surface, they will just vanish before your eyes. It really is a disappearing act and very clever. There we have a, a mating pair of grayling. And moving on to the skippers, the, uh, the small skipper at the top, this is a male. Let me just go back. The small skipper at the top uh, is a male because it has a, a black mark you can see distinctively there running across. And I don't know why it keeps doing this, apologies for that. But that releases pheromones. The bottom picture is a large skipper, again a male. And then zooming in on the uh, antenna, my goodness, <laughs> um, it, it's the computer is taking over. But we have large skippers on the left and small skippers uh, on the right. And here's the large skipper again. You'll see it's not only larger, but it has more markings. And there's the male with that distinctive sex brand where it releases pheromones to attract a female. Um, and a mating pair of small skippers. And there's the small skipper again, a male with that distinctive mark. And there's the female you can see without that mark. So the small skipper is smaller and less marked than the large skipper. And not to be confused with the Essex skipper, which we don't have, so I guess there's no confusion. But if you were to travel further south, you might see Essex skipper looking remarkably like small skipper. And they're almost identical. The only difference really is that the Essex skipper has a little black sooty patch 
on the underside of the tip of the antenna, whereas the small skipper, you'll see it's more orange than black. Apart from that, they are remarkably similar, but are genetically uh, different species. And now we'll look at the, uh, the blue family, which includes the coppers and hair streaks. Um, and some of these might come into your garden. We've already mentioned the holly blue. And if you're lucky and live on the edge of a village or town near to some uh, areas of short turf and wildflowers, especially if there's bird's foot trefoil about, you might be lucky enough to get um, things like common blue coming into your garden. I was, uh, there's the male common blue. I was on Ormskill slag banks only yesterday and saw 60, was it yesterday or the day before? And saw 61 uh, common blue. It's a second generation common blue. Nearly all of those were male. The females are darker and keep a low profile. So they are still there, but less conspicuous. But the male wants to be conspicuous. It wants to say, look at me, I'm beautiful. And the female is thinking, well, I've got other things in my mind, like not being predated on when I'm at my most vulnerable. And I'm at my most vulnerable when I'm laying eggs. So I really don't want to show up too much. Now, some females um, have a fair bit of blue. You see, the last one has a little bit of blue close to the body. And the body hairs can be a little on the blue side. But occasionally you get females with quite a lot of blue. So the Victorians and Edwardians used to like collecting these aberrations and would end up with pin specimens in drawers of hundreds of butterflies, all showing slightly different variations. And uh, that's a slightly more typical uh, female common blue. And that's very untypical. Uh, that's an extreme aberration and quite rare. Um, you'll see the right is very much like a male and the left is more like a male wanting to be a female. So that really is an unusual aberration. You, you're not likely to see too many of those, but the, uh, the common blue can be mistaken for the Northern Brown Argus, especially the female common blue. Um, one way of telling them apart, because the female common blue is, is brown and the northern brown argus is brown, both male and female. So one way of telling them apart is to look when they close their wings for the spots. You'll see the common blue is a little darker and has more obvious black spots and has some extra black spots as indicated by the white arrow. Whereas the northern brown is a slightly smaller butterfly. If you saw them flying together, then it's very likely you would see uh, that some were smaller, as well as having the slightly different markings as shown in the photograph. They can look a little bit sort of silvery, I think, the northern brown. So very small butterflies and a little bit silvery in flight. So there is um, a male common blue and we can tell even though its wings are barely open because it has a lot of blue scales at the bottom of its hind wing nearer to the body and there's a male and a female mating you can see the female below doesn't have so many blue scales and here's an interloper uh, another male coming in fluttering around trying to interfere and say are you sure you really want to wait, mate with that male because I'm much more handsome? And here are actually three. Um, at first, when I saw this photo, I missed the female that's tucked around the left side, but we've got two males, one with its wings a little tatty and a female um, on the left. They're roosting, they're getting ready for night. This is what they do at night time. Having been flying about during the day, by the time we get to late afternoon, they've had enough. They often find uh, seed heads, grass stems, uh, and will settle on the stems or on the seed heads of uh, taller grasses. The holly blue is very much one that is in people's gardens. A lot of people have holly, a lot of people have ivy. 
and they do like to flutter around, usually at about head height, fluttering back and forward along hedgerows in particular. Um, when they shut their wings, you'll see they only have a few little black spots on a more silvery blue background, slightly more slaty blue than the uh, common blue. But in flight, they're easily mistaken. But the common blue tend to fly lower, nearer the ground, whereas the holly blues are quite happy flying at head height or above. They'll even fly into taller shrubs and small trees, whereas the common blue tend not to do that. And there's a holly blue on holly with its wings open. Of course, they don't, the caterpillars don't digest the almost indigestible holly leaf. They actually lay their eggs on the buds of the holly and feed on the buds, not the, the, the leaves are very, very hard. But there's a holly blue uh, nectaring on hemp agrimony. And it's related to the copper, the small copper. We used to have a large copper that became extinct in this country, but Cumbria is home to small coppers, a stunning, stunning butterfly. Um, and they're, they're quite widespread, although in low numbers. So they could pop up into your garden. Um, I sometimes see them at whole herd gardens, those wonderful gardens near Windermere, uh, the Lake District Horticultural Society. If you walk around those gardens at this time of year, there's a fair chance you'll bump into one of these lovely little butterflies. There it is feeding on uh, one of their favorite nectar sources, ragwort. You might not find too much ragwort at the whole herd gardens, but uh, they certainly do love ragwort. Um, and there's a, a view with its wings, uh, with its wings shut. And then green hair streaks uh, are a springtime butterfly. They, they're out more in late March, usually April and going into May. Um, if I want to see those, I will often go to somewhere like um, Falshaw Moss or Mefot Moss. They do like damper areas where bilberry grows in profusion. So their favoured sites are bilberry growing areas, but they will feed on the say gorse and broom and even bird's foot trefoil. So they are much more widespread and under recorded. I think one reason they're under recorded is when they fly, they're a small butterfly that appears to be brown. And when they land, they shut their wings and the green camouflages them. So the brownness tends to make you think, well, it's not a green hair streak. And when they land, they disappear. So they are under recorded and fairly widespread and possibly could visit a garden. But certainly if you go out walking in a slightly damper, wilder area, especially where bilberry is grown, uh, you could well find quite a few of these green hair streaks. They can be quite colonial and uh, you can come across quite large numbers in the right place at the right time. But they only have one brood. So once the butterflies are over by uh, probably the end of April, certainly by May, then really you have to wait now until uh, the following spring. And you can see why it's called a hair streak, because it has this streak running through it. It is related to other hair streaks, which we have, which are less common and more specialized. And there it is. Again, a, quite a distinctive color. There's, there's really only one butterfly that has that particular shade of green in it. It's quite unusual. There are a number of books that you might want to think about buying. I, I love the Richard Lewington uh, illustrated books. If you prefer a photographic guide, the one in the middle is fantastic. The one on the right is more expensive. It's not a, a book that you would buy unless you really wanted to do some more serious reading. Um, there are other books. This is another one that um, I recommend. Uh, again, it's a Richard Lewington book. Um, this one is out of print, but there are new, newer editions available, again, illustrated by Richard Lewington, uh, written by uh, Jeremy Thomas. Any books that are written by Jeremy Thomas, who is incredibly good, and illustrated by Richard Lewington, who's stunning, his artwork is remarkable, uh, I would recommend. Um, 
If you're thinking of going into day flying moths, this is a great little book, these wild guides, and they do a photographic guide as well, as you can see um, on the screen. But um, this day flying moth one is also a, a very, very good book. So in, uh, in Cumbria, these are some of the sites that we visited over the years. We have guided walks to try to see most of these species. Um, although we've concentrated today on the commoner species, so these are ones that you should be able to find without going on a guided walk, but you'd be very welcome to come on our guided walks program. We have our um, members day coming up this Saturday at the stunning Haybridge Nature Reserve. And if you'd like to go to that, and there's a, a program of um, opening moth traps, there are talks by experts, and then there's a guided walk in the afternoon you'd be very welcome. Uh, just let me know after the programme, after this talk has ended, as we come to the close. Um, we only have one butterfly reserve near us, that's at Myers allotment. Uh, that's just indicated by the arrow over here, that's in Silverdale. But you'll see that butterfly conservation do manage a number of reserves across the country. We're lucky that Cumbria Wildlife Trust have so many fantastic reserves in Cumbria. And they do a lot of fantastic um, conservation work for butterflies, as well as for birds and flowers and everything else. So Joe Murphy and his team, uh, based at Plum Gas, are, are absolutely brilliant. And we work with them and uh, they do some tremendous work. You'll see Cumbria is one of these landscape scale conservation sites because so much of Cumbria has been recognized as being of exceptional value for conservation. And we run a series of work parties throughout the winter in our new newsletter that will be going out in just two or three weeks time. Hopefully COVID permitting, we'll be able to resume our work parties on all these conservation sites. So these are the sorts of things we do for our butterflies. And these are the sorts of reports that we're able to produce from all the data that we collect. So do garden for butterflies. Um, I hope I've given you just one or two tips for gardening as well. Um, yes, join Butterfly Conservation. I'm sure you're members of Cumbria Wildlife Trust, which is a fantastic partner organization. Um, there are lots of fantastic reserves in Cumbria for you to enjoy. So do get out and about and visit many of these. I'm sure you know many of the ones that are on the screen right now. And uh, enjoy working with these partner organizations as we do. And let's keep enjoying our butterflies. So that brings us to the conclusion of the talk. Uh, you've been very patient listening to me rabbit on for ages. I'll need to give my vocal cords a bit of a uh, bit of water, but I'm I'm more than happy to answer some questions. So, if you if you haven't sent Lucy a question, uh, please do. Um, you can send her one right now. I'll be very happy to to try to answer any questions. Over to you, Lucy. Thanks, Chris. That was excellent. That was fascinating. Uh, interesting to see them moving north. The butterflies. Um, has anyone got any questions at all? I haven't had any um, sent over so far. Um, give you a few minutes to ask some questions. Anybody? You must have answered will, all their will, questions, Chris. I will, I will ask myself a question. I'll try to ask one that I can actually answer. That's always, always a good sign. Um, but quite a few people have um, have asked me if uh, if COVID has had an impact on butterflies, and of course the answer is is yes, which might seem slightly counterintuitive because you could be thinking, well, how um, you know, uh, given that COVID certainly hasn't had a, a direct impact on other species, but um, we do a lot of conservation work 
and we rely on our membership to help fund that and we rely on our volunteers to support that and we rely on people like you actually uh, tuning in and getting involved and interested in these things and of course covid has meant that many people have felt unable to renew their membership so we've lost members uh, it's meant that um, it hasn't been safe uh, to go on work parties because we often have to work or, although we're outdoors we often have to work closely together we often have to share equipment and tools and share transport it means we sometimes have to drive to places that aren't local so when lockdown was at its most severe um, it did have an impact and it meant that uh, we had to cancel most of our work parties we've had fewer guided walks so we've taken fewer people to visit these sites, which has meant that um, there's been less interest in, in those sites. So at least indirectly, it has. It, nationally, it's meant that um, a lot of our funding has been cut, not deliberately or intentionally, or as part of a strategy, but simply many corporate bodies that would normally like to give have themselves been under financial pressure. And so, of course, BC's funding has then suffered, as indeed has most charity funding. So in all sorts of other ways, it, it has had an impact. And what we're hoping is that as we come out of lockdown and as things improve, um, a lot of these things will gradually, and they'll take time, will build up again, and we'll be able to get back to, to where we were. Um, but as I indicated earlier, um, there's a lot that needs doing, uh, not necessarily so much for the species we've focused on today, because these are our more widespread species that need less management, almost by definition. But the rarer species are so particular that if we let coppice woodland become uncoppiced, if we let grassland become scrubbed over, then these habitats will be degraded so much that we will lose a lot of the rarer species. And Cumbria is actually a, a national stronghold for rare butterflies. And we, we do feel a certain weighty responsibility to do what we can. So I've answered my own question, I hope. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Anyway. So we have got a couple of questions. Um, Sally asks, are there any hints on separating the quetillaries? Sorry? Are, are there, have you got any hints on separating the fritillaries? Um, I, I think you're going to have to say it a little louder. Uh, have you got any hints on separating the fritillaries? Oh, right. Yeah. Um, fritillary butterflies. Yeah. Um, and um, these, these are Cumbria's speciality, really. Um, we're very lucky. Um, yes, I can say a little bit about that. I, I didn't mention fritillaries much today because we were focusing on the, the more common species, but um, you're, you're quite right. Some fritillaries look remarkably similar and can be difficult to separate. Um, first of all, they're two out early on. And the one that comes out the earliest is the pearl bordered fritillary. And if you see a fritillary butterfly flying um, in April and May, uh, then depending on where you are, it could well be a pearl bordered. But you'd have to be on um, some of the key sites. In other words, in Lancashire, Wharton Crag, uh, in Cumbria, we're talking mainly about sites on Whitbarrow or near to Whitbarrow because it's a very, very rare butterfly. It's our second rarest butterfly. If you see a fritillary, a small to medium sized fritillary flying a little later in the year, so we're now talking about late May, but more likely early June, and then throughout June and sometimes into July, then this will be its close relative, the small pearl border fritillary, which is almost the same size, just fractionally smaller, um, but it's much more widespread. So if you're now seeing this butterfly not only later in the year, 
but you're seeing it on sites pretty much all over Cumbria where there's violet, because there must be violet for the caterpillars to feed on, then the chances are that's a small pell bordered. Now, those two fritillaries um, will fly together and they will overlap, but generally speaking, if you see a small to medium butterfly um, in uh, late May, June, and into July, it's going to be a small pearl. You really will have to seek out the pearl border because they are very rare. Um, now, the larger fritillaries in Cumbria, we have three larger fritillaries. Um, the high brown and the dark green look very similar. And again, will fly together, but they don't emerge until later. So they will emerge late June, early July and fly through July and into August. And some of them are still on the wing at the moment. And if we get a bit of warm sun, there'll still be a few about. The dark green will be very tatty. The high brown will have a slightly darker color at the moment. They keep their color better and have a longer tail to their flight period. But um, the dark green is widespread across Cumbria and not particularly rare. Um, whereas the um, high brown, again, you'd have to seek that out and go to particular sites. It really is very specialized uh, and quite rare. If you do find them both together, the dark green has a lot of green on the underside of the wing. Uh, the high brown has distinctive rusty rings uh, on the underside of the wing. And that's the, the main difference. The other large fritillary is the uh, silver washed fritillary, which is still about. They are the biggest fritillary. It's the second biggest butterfly in the UK after the swallowtail. And they are bigger and brighter and still quite fresh at this time of year. It's our last emerging fritillary. So they, they emerge usually in July um, and they'll fly right through uh, July and through most of August, if August is, uh, is nice. So they're on the wing at the moment and it's much more of a woodland butterfly that will fly in woodland glades. The other fritillary I haven't mentioned is the marsh fritillary because um, you have to, uh, to go to sort of damp marshy areas where devil's bit scabious grows. And most of the marsh fritillary colonies are in North and West Cumbria. Um, and it's extremely unlikely to be seen unless you go to particular sites where you know that there's a lot of devil's bit scabious. The best thing to do for that um, on the marsh fritillary is to go onto the Cumbria Butterfly Conservation website, uh, click on newsletters and look at all the series of articles written by Steve Doyle over the last sort of 10, 15 newsletters. And that's a running commentary on where all the marsh fritillary are, how are they doing, where you can find them and so on. But another great thing to do with all these fritillaries is to go onto the website, go on our sightings page and look to see what people have seen and where they've seen them. And you'll soon see there's a pattern to it. There's a picture to it in terms of where they're found, what time of year, which are the commoner ones, which are the very rare ones. And that will also help you greatly in terms of what sort of fritillary you might have. People do sometimes mix them up with uh, wall brown. Some of them can look a little bit like a wall brown. And sometimes people mix them up with a comma. So they're the two that can sometimes look a little bit similar. Anyway, <laughs> I hope that helps. Thanks, Chris. Um, one more question. Did the late frost in May this year have a bad effect on butterflies? Yes. Um, April was certainly very cold, one of the coldest months, one of the coldest Aprils we've had for many, many years. Um, during the day, it was actually quite sunny. It was high, dominated by high pressure. So we had sort of relatively warm days with lots of bright sun, and that was quite good. What wasn't good was the, the nights were so cold and some quite heavy frosts. Now, I said earlier that actually a cold winter is good it sounds counterintuitive, but uh, cold winters are good. What's not so good is when those frosts extend right through April. Because really, at that time of year, 
species like pearl bordered and duke of burgundy and indeed many others are wanting to emerge and they really would find it extremely difficult to emerge if the nights are very frosty so they can delay their emergence but that can give a knock-on problem it can mean that uh, when they do emerge there are fewer of them because some have perished and it can mean that their flight period has been pushed back uh, at a time when they would really rather not be in flight so in other words their nectar sources might not be available or the caterpillar food plants might have deteriorated a little bit so there can be knock-on effects so the short answer is extreme weather is usually not helpful and of course with climate change we're getting more extreme weather and there will be sadly more times when we get extreme aprils or droughts heavy rain may was almost as much a problem as april because may was incredibly wet it was one of our wettest ever months and so some species would have been uh, caterpillars or uh, pupa underwater and would have been flooded uh, so extreme weather is a problem uh, butterflies are resilient they're remarkably resilient they will bounce back they have always had good years and bad years the the the, the thing that's different is we're getting more uh, unusual events that are going to create more problems especially for our rarer butterflies and these are very difficult to to mitigate against no matter what we do um, that that is an issue um, having said that um, once we got to about the 26th of may the weather changed dramatically and we then had nine weeks of fantastic weather and so a lot of species were able to catch up and even if emergence was down flight periods were very good because they had more sunny days to fly mm -hmm. and that meant more opportunities to meet mate lay eggs so fortunately the, the cold april and the wet may were to some extent offset by the nine weeks that followed okay thank you chris um that, that was really interesting i think that's all the questions that we've got for today um they've said thank you as well the questioners so thank you chris um yeah that was a really interesting and valuable talk it's interesting to see how they're doing with climate change and extreme events and um changing conditions um, but yeah, Chris, thank you so much for today. Uh, I think everyone's really enjoyed it. No um, pleasure. Uh, and thank you all for, I keep wanting to say tuning in, but I'm not sure that's the right phrase. But <laughs> thank you for joining this Zoom. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. All right. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye, folks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Lots of clapping. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Bye, everyone.